Good everyone. Good morning. Uh, yeah, just uh, briefly about about No Age, New Orleans Advocates for GLBT Elders. Uh, you'll see on uh, on our rack cards a little bit about us. Um, and what we do is kind of a two pronged approach. We um, to address isolation and maybe loneliness in older adults, we have recurring events such as uh, a monthly potluck, uh, a weekly walking group, uh, movie nights, and coffee talks once a month at Crescent Care. Uh, and then we have like, kind of a, a variety of one-off events, Christmas parties, that kind of thing, uh, just for uh, to increase socialization for LGBT older adults. The other arm of what we do is what you're a part of today, which is our, our cultural competence trainings. So we, we when you're trying to reach an isolated LGBT elder, uh, how do you reach them? They're isolated, right? But the one place that they're going to almost certainly go is to the physician. They're going to go to a doctor, a clinic. They're going to go see a nurse in the ER, uh, case managers. So it's really important to us to, to reach you all so that you can know that A, we're a resource for you, and B, that you can refer your clients to uh, the socialization events I just mentioned. Um, and I do want to also uh, bring up this uh, flyer you, you, you have here on your desk. On uh, Saturday, November 16th, uh, we are hosting, as far as I'm aware, the first ever summit on HIV and aging here in New Orleans. Uh, it's going to be a Crescent Care. Um, we're going to have a great array of speakers on a variety of topics to do with LGBT and HIV aging. And uh, I really hope you can make it if possible. We're going to have lunch, we're going to have breakfast, uh, keynote speaker from Sage in New York. It's uh, really looking forward to this. Um, but yeah, let's get, go ahead and get started. Uh, just a brief note, uh, Dr. Roland is not here with me today. The last time I did this presentation, I added her in. Uh, but I neglected to remove that, but uh, she's she's a wonderful person. She does uh, our coffee talk once a month at Crescent Care, uh, the second Saturday of the month, 10 a.m. So uh, to get started, I'd like to take a look at, if you have a, a client patient who's an LGBT elder, when they come into your office or your space, your place of work, um, what to maybe be aware of uh, when you're meeting them for the first time. So let's look at kind of a lifespan perspective. What was it maybe like for uh, an LGBT person growing up, coming of age in the 20th century? Well, as most of us know, uh, a lot of prejudice and stigma. As you can see, opinion polls were very uh, anti-gay. Uh, wasn't much knowledge about bisexuality, or, uh, gender identity in these days. But the uh, majority of people believe that consenting gay sex should be illegal um, between adults. Um, I put hate crimes on this slide. It, it really deserves its own slide. Um, and what I mean by the primary victim and the secondary victim. So for me, the I'm 40. Uh, when I was coming of age, I was at uh, an undergrad when Matthew Shepard was murdered, and I just remember thinking, Jesus, this poor kid, what he went through, what his, his family was going through. Uh, but then the next thought you have, well, that could have really been me and the community that I grew up in. Um, so in that sense, hate crime, it spreads fear uh, throughout the community of, of the, uh, that the uh, primary victim uh, belongs to. Uh, microaggressions is, is one of the, those words that gets people really aggressive when they hear it. It's uh, what it basically means is uh, just kind of a ver the little day-to-day -day slights you might deal with if you are a member of a minority group. Uh, for example, why haven't you gotten married yet? Or uh, who is who is this friend of yours that you're with? Just uh, little things that like, a gay person might go through uh, that kind of makes them a little afraid to be out, a little scared to, to be open with whoever they're talking to. Um, you know, in a medical setting, for uh, 
No, uh, I'd say a trans person goes into uh, a medical clinic and uh, the, the receptionist misgenders them, for example. Maybe it's not even on purpose, but it's just a little slight that the person has to deal with it. Over time, those things kind of add up to uh, a lot of, well, internalized stigma, which is what we're going to get to in a second. But when we look back at what an LGBT person dealt with, just looking at the media, movies, TV shows, they were, generally speaking, kind of even looked at as something like a joke, object of ridicule, uh, something that was evil or mentally deranged uh, uh, in films, or some, they meet some tragic end, uh, suicide, murder. Uh, that tended to be the, the typical three ways that it went for uh, LGBT people in film. Um, I'm going to skip. Well, this is a song. Objects of ridicule. And how they would first peek at a gay bar. Mentally deranged. Here we have uh, the movie Rebecca with Mrs. Danvers, which doesn't seem to want to. Let me get Nothing has been altered since that last night. Come. We have Mrs. Standers, who's the prototypical evil lesbian trying to, who's in love with her, uh, the woman who employed her. As you can tell, they, they make her out to look very evil, and uh, the main character is quite afraid of her. Still a great cast, but uh, just one example of that sort of evil character. If anybody seen Lost in Space, there's another kind of example. Tragic kind of end, you know, we have... Uh, By now, the pattern was clear. Characters of questionable sexuality would meet with a nasty end in the last room. Make idea <laughs> so um, you know if you're if you're an LGBT person and you're growing up and these are the only representations of yourself you see on film you kind of get to thinking that these people are right about you that you are evil deranged sick uh, a joke something that we laughed at um, maybe you dealt with abuse from psychiatry uh, conversion therapy is still going on in some states um, <coughs> Tulane has its own history of these abuses. Um, at, in the Department of Neuropsychology, uh, Dr. Robert Heath uh, at Tulane was doing experiments on gay men. He implanted electrodes in their brains and um, paired, paired them with a female prostitute and had them have sex while he stimulated the pleasure center of the brain to try to convert the, uh, the patient to straight. It sounds crazy, like a science fiction kind of thing, but it really happened here in New Orleans. And uh, by the way, the Tulane Neuropsych uh, Alumni Association is still the Robert Heath Society. So Tulane, I don't believe, has really reckoned with some of its own history when it comes to some of these things. Um, homosexuality was only removed from the uh, DSM in 1973. That's the book that psychiatrists use to diagnose mental disorders. Um, gender identity disorder was only removed in 2013, and there's still a diagnosis called gender dysphoria. Uh, just an example of being pathologized, uh, considered mentally ill, uh, that you might have dealt with growing up at this time. Criminalization. It wasn't until 2003 that Supreme Court ruled that yes, consenting adults can have sex uh, with other consenting adults. They're gay. Um, even so, in 2015, there were two men who were arrested in Baton Rouge for violating sodomy laws. 
Uh, by criminalization of HIV, an example of that. So uh, it's illegal for anybody to spit on a police officer, right? But if you have <coughs> HIV and you spit on a police officer, you're going to face much harsher penalties. Uh, there's no transmission of HIV by spitting on someone. But uh, those laws are still in place and on the books in states like Louisiana. Um, bathroom bills, or some people call them religious freedom bills. Uh, this, this policing of where people go to the bathroom, uh, policing of gender um, that we're seeing you know, to this day. And as I mentioned earlier, over time, when you look back on the, uh, the stigma in film, the, the stigma from psychiatry and medical practice, uh, criminalization, uh, not to mention religious uh, history. I mean, if, you, if you grew up in a very strict religious background, this can be a really difficult thing to come to terms with uh, your sexuality and gender. Um, family rejection, friend rejection, uh, being evicted from your home, uh, all of this over time can add up to what we call internalized stigma or internalized homophobia or transphobia, um, where you just start to believe that all these things about you are true. And yes, I'm a bad person. This is, I'm bad. I need to get uh, conversion therapy. Um, and for LGBT older adults who dealt with this all their life, you have to remember that now they are also dealing with issues of ages. Um, if they're members of other minority groups, it can be even further compounded by other types of discrimination. So this is not to completely depress you, but to kind of give you an idea of when you have a, a the patient come and you wonder why they're not being immediately forthcoming with you about you know, their sex life or who their partner is. Um, things that can have a, a real effect on their health. Um, it's because there's a lot of this instilled fear, this internalized stigma, and there, you know, a lot of you are younger and you you don't quite understand it, but they're afraid. A lot of people are afraid of the medical profession. I teach this stuff, and I still get a little cringy when I'm having this conversation with my you know, healthcare providers because you take it in over time, especially if you grow up in a small town like I did. So it's a very real feeling, and uh, it's something to, if you leave with nothing else, just to be aware um, of what the patient might be bringing. Just kind of an illustration of what an internalized stigma might feel like. Um, so we'll talk next about health disparities in the LGBT community in general. We'll get to some more that have to do with aging-related disparities. Um, uh, there are mental disorders, depression, anxiety, uh, substance abuse, are all more common in LGBT people. Um, probably because of the stuff we just talked about. I almost want to have a drink right now after having just discussed it. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, it's some heavy stuff, and this adds up on a person's psyche. Um, the, uh, the, the portion of this slide is, that always gives me pause. If, if you grow up in a community, I grew up in Gre Greensburg, Louisiana, very small, 500 people. If you grow up in somewhere like Greensburg, which is not very accepting of LGBT people, you live on average 12 years shorter of a lifespan uh, that you might live in, say, a place like New Orleans, which is more accepting. That's fairly you know, jaw-dropping. I mean, that you that just where you grow up could have that much of an effect on how long you live based on something as simple as your uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. <clears throat> this right here, I, I'm happy to say, is changing. And again, you're part of that today. It's, you know, there, there used to not be a lot of education about this for physicians, nurses, uh, case managers, uh, etc. But I think that the, that is starting to turn around. But that being said, LGBT people are still having to kind of teach, especially trans people, are having to teach their own uh, providers how to provide them with, with good care. Because there isn't enough education about it. And you have people who, I mean, 
many of you are in school now, but most of the people who went to, to, to schools of medicine in the past uh, were not being taught this information. Um, this is about people who are transgender and they're out to the providers. Uh, they tend, if, if, if a person is trans and out to the healthcare pr provider or EMT or whoever, they're more likely to be discriminated against, even physically assaulted in some cases. Uh, the, uh, the person who came up with this uh, presentation initially, before we altered it a little bit, uh, was Liz Margulies, who works for the LGBT Cancer Network. So it was important to her to point out that uh, we are at an, an increased risk for certain cancers. Uh, for example, uh, men who've had uh, HIV or at higher risk of getting anal cancer. Um, we have lower screening rates, increased challenges in survivorship. Why would we have the increased challenges in survivorship? Well, if you move from Greensboro to New Orleans, you know, you don't have family, you don't have you know, a brother or sister, maybe you're not married. <coughs> Who takes care of you? Who's your provider? Who's your caretaker? Um, if you don't have somebody to drive you to appointments uh, and provide that kind of care, it, you're, it's going to be a bigger challenge to deal with uh, a tough kind of illness like cancer. Didn't mention uh, suicidality and uh, how much greater the risks are for uh, suicidal thoughts and attempts. Uh, among the LGBT people, especially youth and transgender people, it's very high numbers. Um, even post Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, LGBT people are less likely than others to have medical insurance. So of course that that uh, comes with its own uh, challenges. Smoking is is a huge issue in the community. Does anybody want to hazard a guess why there might be more smoking uh, in the LGBT community? Anybody? I hear whispers. <laughs> Public health. So why, think about this. You know, why, why would this particular population be at a greater risk for smoking? As a coping mechanism? Coping mechanism? Where have, for example, gay people tended to gather. Bars. 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 And until recently in New Orleans, you could smoke in the bars, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in most places in the country. So what you have is people trying to build community and the only place for a long time that was available to them has been bars. So uh, they're exposed to alcohol, exposed to drugs, exposed to cigarettes. <coughs> and they're also dealing, as you said, with this internalized stigma and distress. So it makes smoking more likely. Not to mention the tobacco companies have created specific campaigns to target uh, LGBT people and other minorities, specifically targeting them. It was specifically planned for them for this to happen. They knew that they were in the bar. Um, again, with the alcohol and drug use. Uh, so. <laughs> Gay and bisexual men are much more likely to be at risk for eating disorders than, uh, than straight men. And uh, lesbian women have a higher rate of obesity, which can put them at risk for you know, all kinds of diseases that are uh, comorbid with obesity. Um, special slide here for bisexual health. Um, a lot of the stuff that we've already been covering, bisexual people tend to deal with the, all of these issues at the, the higher rates than lesbian and gay people. Um, I'll ask the question again, why would that be? Why would, you know, if the LGBT, why is the B having more trouble than the, than the L and the G? Anybody? Maybe they're not seen as, maybe they're not always accepted by the community. Right, so yeah, if, if, if you're, oh, you're not part of the gay community, well, you know, don't hang out with us. Oh, you're not part of the straight community, don't hang out with us. Who is your community? Where do you find that? 
uh, if, if, if gay people are looking at you, like, what, well, this is a phase you're going through. Straight people are saying, this is a phase you're going through. Yes, you're going to have a lot more stress. Good. Um, some other LGBT health disparities um, to look at. Uh, the risk of HIV, um, especially with uh, African American men who have sex with men, and uh, uh, transgender women of color, the numbers are really astronomical. Uh, half of African American uh, men who have sex with men are going to get an HIV diagnosis in their lifetime, uh, according to the CDC. Half. This is insane. This is this is uh, it's. It's a huge problem. Um, and over half of trans women of color do have HIV. Um, we're gonna talk about PrEP in just a second, but clearly not enough is being done to get, uh, to get PrEP or Truvada PrEP to these populations. And that's, that's where a lot of your work, I hope, will be in uh, changing some of these numbers. Um, the white gay men are kind of they're hooked up, they're on prep. You know, they, they have the access that uh, other members of the community don't. Um, so that, this really needs to be the focus moving forward. Um, so, has everybody heard of Truvada for PrEP? Is this a new term? So just for those of you, of you who might not know, it's uh, PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, Truvada is the name of the drug uh, marketed by Gilead. And, for people who take this medication as directed, if they um, are exposed to HIV, if they have unprotected sex with somebody who has HIV, uh, they're almost certainly not going to get trans, they're not, they're not going to get HIV. Because the, uh, the, the medication, Truvada, uh, is, is, is preventing that transmission from happening. Uh, just maybe like one or two cases where it's actually been transmitted that they talk about, but if you have uh, patients, clients, mm -hmm. who uh, may be you know, at higher risk for HIV, i.e., you know, some of the, the groups we were just talking about before, especially, you know, have this conversation. You know, have you heard about Truvada? Have you heard about PrEP? There's, there's a medication you can take that can prevent you from getting HIV. We can wipe out the epidemic. Um, and by the way, for, for people who are on uh, any retroviral drugs who are HIV positive, uh, if their viral load is suppressed and undetectable, they can't transmit HIV. Um, with these two things, you know, uh, being undetectable if you are positive or taking PrEP if you're at risk, this is kind of, we have the tools at hand. The, the, the problem is, is one for you and the public health to help solve and, and uh, hopefully wipe out HIV in the United States and worldwide. Um, so we'll move on. Any questions about that? I have a comment about it, and that's Truvada. I, 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 I'm, I'm really frustrated by the uh, by PrEP being so encouraged. I understand the results, but uh, I don't hear anyone talk about the uh, side effects of Truvada and mm -hmm. how. You know, so many people have suffered from taking Truvada over the years. So I appreciate that it takes care of things, but um, I'm really troubled by the fact that uh, Gilead and uh, people are not discussing anything about the serious side effects of Truvada and how dangerous it can be. It's a fair criticism. I mean, with any drug, there's definitely going to be risk. And it's not for everybody, for sure. Uh, I think it, you know, as healthcare. Uh, providers, you have to kind of consider the risks versus the the, the gains, you know. So, it, so it's definitely not for everyone. And I should point out that uh, it doesn't prevent the transmission of other STDs. So uh, use, the using a condom is not a bad idea either. Um, and when, I'm going to get to the, another question, there, but uh, I wanted to say real quick, there's also post-exposure prophylaxis. So if you have a client who has who comes to you, they haven't been taking PrEP, but they come to you and say, look, I've made, I've, you know, I think I put myself at risk for HIV, I don't know what to do. Send them to the ER.
They can get prescribed Truvada and another medication as well. If they take it as directed for about a month, they almost certainly will not get HIV. Uh, even though they weren't taking PrEP before, it, it, it works to prevent the transmission. Um, they, used, they originally used this in people who were working in hospitals who might have gotten, for example, pricked by a needle. So they'd give them Truvada uh, to prevent the transmission. It's a comment. Um, so Truvada, or this month, a second drug was approved for PrEP use called Discovery. And it um, has less side effects. Um, it just, just happened a few weeks ago, though, so it hasn't uh, been My been comment was about the fact that many people are taking Truvada, okay. you know, right. on this new PrEP thing. So that doesn't affect the people who are taking Truvada. Well, like, you, you said that people aren't talking about the side effects. And the, my response to that is they are. The drug just wasn't approved yet. So you could, uh, before this month, you could get to SCOBY off-label. Um, and like the intention among, my understanding among like Gilead and, and the pharmaceutical industry was to create more options for PrEP. I'm in a trial that um, I have like an injection every other month. So there's like, you may not see it, you may not hear it because it's not available yet, but there is momentum to create prep options that aren't Shibata, that have less side effects and that are better. So those those balls are in motion. Discovery was approved, there's other ones come down the line. So you don't hear about it because it's still on the science stage. It, it troubles me that there's so much promotion without being really upfront about what the problem is. Did you have a question too? Is that a, is that a uh, is a cost a barrier for people? Well, it is covered by insurance. Uh, Med Medicaid, for example, covers it. I, I think that, that Gilead does have programs to help people pay for it. If they don't have the ability to pay, there are programs to help. Uh, Next year, Chicago will become um, will be available in generic form. Mm -hmm. um, and Gilead does offer um, like co-payment like programs like shared person. So there's are a lot of instruments and just things for all the But it is very expensive and and, and, I, and I think that your point is well taken that the trusting pharmaceutical companies wholeheartedly is not necessarily the best way to go, but I guess we're talking about risks versus you know mm -hmm. benefits. Um, so moving on to to disparities of older LGBT adults, we talked about some of the, uh, the loneliness and isolation, not having a caretaker, um, feeling a lack of companionship. Um, in fact, there was a study that came out just this year that showed that LGBT people are, are more likely to be caretakers themselves. Um, you don't have kids, you take care of mom, or you're not, you know, they're, they're the heterosexual cisgender siblings or, or are more likely to say well, you should be the one to do this since you're not you don't have a family of your own uh, for example so the people who are in most need for a caretaker are often in the role of caretaker themselves um, we spoke or i spoke earlier about the uh the reasons why people don't come out to their providers why is that a problem why the a question i get sometimes is why do we even need to ask these questions? Why do we need to know about what somebody does in the bedroom? Why, that's none of my business. Why is why is that our business as healthcare uh, professionals? Or not? Why is it not? It has unique risks and uh, maybe health challenges that would be related to, to whatever activity you're doing, regardless of your sexuality. Like there are impacts, like you said. Gay men are more likely to have like certain kinds of cancer. Well, you wouldn't know to like look for the screen for those kind of things if you didn't know what they were doing. But it's like that would you know apply to all sexuality. So I think most doctors ask everyone because it is relevant to everybody. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a great example. Of gay men who have uh, or men who have not necessarily gay men, but men who have HIV are at more a higher risk for getting anal cancer. Uh, you know, some of the unique health risks we talked about earlier, uh, greater risk of obesity, some of these things that we, we don't tend to think about because they're unique to certain populations. So we maybe not, don't put that on the intake form, don't ask that question during the, the evaluation, but it's something to bear in mind that, that 
we do include some of these questions about orientation, it can save somebody's life. It's really, it's, it's about providing good patient care. You know, when I give uh, this, these trainings, it's a, the full length one is really three hours long, so you're kind of getting a really condensed uh, amount of information. I try to stress that, look, I know that not everybody is open-minded about LGBT people. That's I, fine. My concern is that that healthcare professionals are giving good patient care. Not that they change what they think or believe or whatever, uh, convict, personal convictions. That doesn't matter when you come to work. Uh, so that being said, I do understand the, the fear about talking about sex with patients or clients. It's, it's an awkward conversation. And there is a, maybe not a total, total solution, but there is something that can make it a lot easier, and that, and that is an inclusive intake form. And uh, I'm going to get to that in just a second. Um, Oh, I'm supposed to update this statistic. <laughs> so, uh, in 2015, 47% of people age 50 and older, uh, this is the rewind, about 50% of people who have HIV now are 50 and older. A few years ago, it was 47%. We're almost certainly at over 50% now. So, almost probably most people who are HIV positive are moving into older adulthood. Is something to be aware about. It, a lot of times when people think of HIV, they tend to think of, we have to prevent this in the younger generation. Of course we do. But it's also worth thinking about that um, there are people who've been surviving this for decades, and that, and that comes with its own issues. And, and uh, that's you know, the reason we're having this summit uh, next month, to talk about some of these issues. One of the problems is that if someone gets a new diagnosis of HIV, HIV when they're over 50, it tends to be later in the course of the illness. Why? I mean, well, doctors don't like to talk about sex, and they don't, definitely don't like to talk about sex with older people. Oh, I don't want to have that conversation and make them uncomfortable when you could be putting them at risk, uh, keeping them sick longer when they could be getting treatment. Um, and the good news is that people are living alone. Now, my best friend has been positive for well over 30 years. Uh, but that also means that what, what a lot of researchers are seeing is that people who, who, uh, who are HIV positive, the onset of senescence happens earlier than that. So in other words, these kind of typical diseases you, that are associated with aging, like hypertension, uh, um, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, these things are happening at earlier ages than usual, for whatever reason. I don't know that it's completely understood at this point, and there is some uh, dispute about it, but that tends to be what I'm, the information that I'm getting, is that the onset of senescence is earlier. Um, hand is a, it's a type of dementia that some people who've had HIV for a long time might get, not necessarily get, but may get. Um, Body image uh, issues. Um, lipodystrophy is a side effect of, of antiretrovirals. They can uh, change the way that fat is distributed on the body, and this can be distressing for people. Um, you're also looking at a generation of people who dealt with a lot of grief, a lot of loss, loss of partners, loss of friends, family, uh, community. Um, and there are not a lot of HIV programs that are specifically geared towards uh, people who are aging. You can notice we just said and most people with HIV right now really are over 50. And it's, it's, that number is going to, that percentage is going to get higher. Um, not going to read everything in this, but this is one of the biggest reasons we exist, is to give no age exists. It's to give these trainings at long-term care facilities because people are being discriminated against. People are afraid to come out because they're going to be bullied by Mr. Smith or the roommate next door. They're afraid that the staff is going to mistreat them. They're afraid. They're afraid. You know, and for me, this this generation, call them the Stonewall generation, the idea that they would, you know, build the community that I get to enjoy. 
that they're the reason we're having this conversation. And they'd have to go to a long-term care facility and deal with this kind of thing is just unacceptable. And I, I wish that it were easier to get into these facilities to give the trainings. I wish I could stress harder to the administrators and, and the associations uh, that the, the nursing home associations, the assisted living association, I don't think they get it in Louisiana yet. I don't think they get it. It's very hard to get into these facilities. Uh, and we're going to keep pushing. But if you know if you know somebody who works in a nursing home, assisted living, and you can get us in, we'll give the training for free. You know, we, we want to do this work. Um, trans elders might hide uh, their gender identity, maybe the, the transition. I've read about cases where people in the LGBT community will say, well, if I have to go to long-term care, I'd rather commit suicide. Uh, so obviously, you know, the problem really needs to be addressed. It's not, it's starting to change, but not quickly. So, now that you're thoroughly, thoroughly depressed, <laughs> and I brought you down, I, I do want to say something about resilience, okay? This is a resilient group of people, right? This is, they're the reason we're having the conversation, they're the ones who came out when it meant losing family, friends, jobs, homes, losing everything to create community for themselves, to live an authentic life, and to, and to love who they love, and to be who they were. So that takes strength in the face of the kind of things that we were talking about that they dealt with, the, the, the social stigma, the legal stigma, the psychiatry, all of it. This is a strong group of people. So yes, these problems that we've been talking about today are very real. But I don't want anybody to leave here thinking that this is a hopeless situation. Uh, in fact, I'm coming to you with, with hope that you can be part of the solution and to get this, keep this conversation going and about the need for awareness among healthcare professionals about all of this. Um, so, so don't be too depressed about it, but be aware, right? Uh, this, is, this is real stuff and we can change this. And, and I really thank you for being willing to even to, to participate. It, it, I appreciate it. Because this is my, this, this group is my group of heroes. They made my, a lot of things possible for me. So I appreciate you being here and showing up for me. Um, this is just some information about how, you know, we can, at clinics and places, you know, hospitals, where we can kind of create a more welcoming environment so that people are more likely to be open about their uh, sexuality and gender. Um, everybody's seen the rainbow flag, rainbow stickers. These are just examples like that. It's a first impression. You walk in. If I walk in and I see, oh, it's a rainbow flag, receptionist desk. Okay, maybe this place is cool and I can, I don't have to feel that weird cringy thing like are they gonna judge me when I have this conversation with a doctor. Uh, it's not, you know, a solution, like a complete solution, but it can be a good first step, you know. Most of us are familiar with the, the rainbow flag, um, one of their symbols. There is a, uh, a website, where is it? Right here, um, and I'm gonna send this slideshow to you all, but you can get these free uh, cards that say, you know, they have the rainbow flag and you know, everyone welcome kind of thing cards and posters, they'll, send, they'll mail it to you for free. Um, so you'll, you'll be able to get that. Um, other ways that, you know, providers can improve trust in their organization among their LGBT clients. One thing that's not in here, you know, whenever I go to the doctor's office and I see the, the, like the anti-discrimination policy, I always look to see who they left off because it, you know, more times than not, not it's, it's going to be uh, the LGBT community because you don't legally have to do that at the federal level uh, at this point, um, and that's and that's in jeopardy right now. So, uh, medical organizations that do include LGBT people in the anti-discrimination policy, not just for patients but for staff, uh, we we need uh, more of that. Um, And you know, even given my, my little bit of criticism of Tulane for still having the neuropsych department named after the guy who 
torture my people. Uh, I do acknowledge that Tulane is doing some great work today with this and, uh, and, and being uh, willing to have these trainings uh, provided for their students. Um, what you can do is from the, if you go to uh, our website, it's on the card, uh, we recently uh, included a resource guide on there. It's a resource guide for LGBT older adults. It's, uh, it took a lot of time and a lot of work from the students, myself, and other volunteers, and there's a lot of great resources in it. I, I really encourage you to take a look at that if you have a moment. Um, and be prepared to share that with any clients who might benefit from it. But there are other resource guides too. It just, it, it's worth knowing when you're going in what, what does, for example, you know, Crescent Care does a lot of the HIV training. You know, uh, Louisiana Trans Advocates is a good resource for, for trans folks who are looking for a support group, for example. So just to sort of be aware of what, what, is, what exists in your community for your uh, patients and clients. Um, so back to in inclusive intake forms. It, the reason it makes it so much easier is the patient goes in, sees the, the intake form, and they ask about uh, gender identity. They ask about uh, orientation. They immediately, the patient immediately knows, okay, this place is, they're educated about stuff. Maybe I can talk to this. Group. I saw the rainbow flag. I saw an inclusive intake form. I'm going to be honest here. Um, it makes it they don't have to have that awkward feeling with the provider and the, the provider doesn't have to you know have that awkward moment of well, let's talk about sex. They already see it. It's on the intake form. It's, oh I see here that you, you uh, you're a you're a, you're a trans woman of color. Let's Let's talk about PrEP, or Tribata PrEP, um, just for example. So it's inclusive intake forms can save lives in this way, I and mean, it's, it's really worth uh, moving towards. And a lot faster, I mean, you, you, you say, well, we gotta overhaul the, the whole computer system. Well, no, you don't. You just gotta make a few programming changes, and it's something that really should be instituted, especially in the world, especially in the so I think that that's a, a really good step that providers can take, no matter how large or small the organization or uh, entity. Um, the, uh, providers don't, aren't often, uh, most people have met gay people, they know they've met gay people, they don't always know that they know a lot of it, that they've met trans people. They don't, they're not always as educated about trans uh, healthcare issues, uh, and they feel awkward, like I'm going to say the wrong thing. Well, you may say the wrong thing, but basically when you meet a trans patient and, and you don't know uh, the preferred name, if you don't know the, the, the uh, pronoun, just ask the question. Um, now, if somebody came in for a cold, you don't need to, to you know, say, okay, well, I need to get you to an endocrinologist, stat. You know, you don't want to have invasive or unnecessary questions, but uh, just something to be aware of. And this goes for, for the whole LGBT community. I think you know, we're, we're, all, we're in a kind of a politically charged time. Everybody's on the edge and scared and angry uh, about, the, about terminology. And, and I'll tell you why terminology matters, if I can. You know, if you, what it takes to change a driver's license, to change on your driver's license, the humiliations you have to go through, step by step, uh, being looked at funny, being maybe called Nate, if you're willing to go through that and change your gender on your, uh, to affirm your gender on your license, it's pretty important. People don't put themselves through this kind of difficulty for no reason or just to, to aggravate you know, people. Uh, and if you've gone through your whole life not having a term that means, that means it's meaningful to you, if you don't, and then one day you find, you hear about this term, and that's me, I, I feel that. That's, that affirms what I feel. Uh, 
people should have that. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's not a, I don't think it's a tough argument, but that being said, people make mistakes, you know, on the other end. People do make mistakes. If you make a mistake, you slip up, you just apologize, you move on, you make it a big issue. That doesn't guarantee that somebody is going to immediately forgive you and say, oh, it's okay. Because they may have been dealing with all of this stuff for decades. They may not have been in the mood to, to be misgendered that day or to, to have you know, something you know, upsetting said to them. But uh, nevertheless, it's, I, I think that it's important to, to, to try to be gentler with each other, to try to assume good intent and uh, give people the benefit of the doubt. I try to do that. That's, that's just my opinion. Um, and this is just a little quote about that. I mean, stepping on toes, the unintentional pain caused by it, a newfound willingness to understand and work with people who are different. Um, I told you about no age. I don't know where we are with time, but does anybody have any, we got a few minutes. Anybody have any questions from their practice? Things that have come, things that I said today that are mistaken, because I, I learn every time I do this presentation almost every time. I'll get some input that helps me shape the way it's going to be in the future because things do change. The way we think about things change. So, uh, questions, comments, thoughts? I have a question. Thank you, first of all, Jim. This is lovely um, and so important to, to learn about. You mentioned that you have experience going to long-term care facilities to try and give opportunities to educate people. Are, are you being sought out by them at all? How are those experiences once you do get an opportunity to talk to them? So I've made a couple of sweeps I'd say, uh, where I went to the facility and, and it's it can be really difficult to get past the front desk. They'll say, oh, I'll take this, we'll get back with you. And then they don't get back with you. Uh, it, I, I think that the key is really knowing either a patient there who mm -hmm. has an advocate or is an advocate for themselves or knowing a staff person who can direct me to, you really want to talk to this administrator, I think that they'd be open to this, here's their email. It's, you kind of have to go in through the side door with this, uh, unless, you know, they're just, a lot of these, these you know, Medicaid reimbursed nursing homes, I mean, they're not reaching out about this. They, they, they probably feel that they already have enough trainings going on, it's not an issue. Uh, but New Orleans has one of the highest percentages of LGBT people in America, and it's, it's definitely time that, 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 that some of these facilities woke up to the, to the knowledge that, you know, if, I mean, if it comes down to the money, let it come down to money. If you can be in the nursing home, this is a living facility that is LGBT welcoming, you can get a lot of patients that way. I don't know. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other thoughts or uh, examples from your practice or concerns? I have a question specifically to your comment about some mentioning that they would rather commit suicide rather than go into a long care facility. Have you divulged more? Is it primarily caused by the stigma they may face, discrimination at the facility, or are there any other factors that they're contributing to such? So, yeah, about suicidal thoughts and having to go into long-term care. Uh, I read about this, I have the, it's a huge textbook, The Handbook of LGBT Elders. And it was, it was a chapter on transgender issues in long-term care. And they, they had a quote from a, someone who, a trans elder who said that, that they would rather commit suicide than go. And I think that in that particular case, it was a matter of, thinking if that person had to go into long-term care, they would have to either detransition and hide where they were to fit in with staff and peers, or, uh, and that just seemed like turning around something that was impossible to turn around. Uh, that they finally found peace with themselves and they weren't willing to go through hell again about it, they were there and back. So. That's my understanding of that particular case that I, was, I read about. Uh, but yeah, I think it's about fear of bullying, um, the fear of even staff just looking at you weird, not necessarily even saying anything. 
uh, one of the uh, board members of No Age some years back, five years ago, so the reason he got involved was he went to visit his mother in her nursing home, and his mother was was uh, talking to a man who I guess was perceived to be gay. Because when this this man walked away, and another fellow walks up, and he said, "You know, in my day, we used to to, to kill those faggots." And uh, you know, the, the board member heard that, and he said, "Oh my God, is this what my people are dealing with? Is this the fear? Is this the the hostility that they're having to live with in, in nursing homes?" People don't you don't think about it if you don't know somebody in a nursing home if you've never had to. If you've never thought about what it would be like if you had to go, these things don't come to mind, but they are happening. And we, we, we want very much to make the staff and the administration aware and get these trainings to those places. And a nursing home, I mean, it's, it's, it's not something that a person has a chance to walk away from. They're there. Mm -hmm. And they're there all, all the time. So there's no relief from you know, any oppression they might be feeling from others. So, I mean, you know, like, to me it makes perfect sense for somebody to say, I'd rather die than go into a situation where I'm gonna suffer so. And, and going back to, yes, and going back to what I said earlier, it's not just about, you know, educating the staff, it's also about letting people know that no age exists. And mm -hmm. People send visitors to, we have lots of people who would love to come visit someone in the home. We have people, we have events that we can give them a ride to. Uh, we can get them out of the home, you know, get back in the community for a meeting. Uh, so it's, that, that's important too. It's, you know, those of us who are not in the nursing home to, to make our efforts to, to make things a little better while for the person who is there. Yeah. And you know, most seniors don't end up in nursing homes. I, I don't want it to be like an open. This is the, but this is just one aspect of things that I think are particularly troublesome to me, uh, and should be to all of all LGBT people. Because none of us are getting younger. You know, this, these are things we're all going to have to think about. Uh, you know, caretaking. Uh, it's a lot. Um, I have another question. So, as you mentioned, most people are aging in a nursing home or uh, a different type of care facility. And there are lots of companies that have in-home care. Are they, is that some, a group that you also work with? Because I imagine that that's also an opportunity for uh, education and uh, learning. Yeah, for example, Home Instead is a, you know, they do, they're not a home health company. They send like sitter, they're a sitter mm -hmm. service. You know, that we work together and uh, they're a sponsor of us. They're very aware of our services. They don't, uh, They've done a training for us. We've done trainings with them, uh, so there, there, there is that, uh, and there. You know, I can't name a home health agency off the top of my head. Uh, if you look in our resource guide, we have the way that we compile this resource guide uh, is all of those businesses were given phone calls, and we're asked three questions: A, are you LGBT friendly? Um, B, have you had cultural competence training? And C, do you want one? <laughs> so do you want the training? So, uh, you know, if, if, and there are some, some businesses, in hot, like, there's a major hospital that was left out because uh, the receptionist who answered was something very homophobic to the person who calls. I mean, they're not in that resource guide. And we, we wanted to make those calls so that, that our elders didn't have to hear those kinds of things. So, uh, does that mean we can we can promise that every business in there is you know completely wonderful you know home, homophobia transphobia free from that? But we did make that that was how uh, uh, inclusion was determined. Yeah, I have all right. Time. Well, thank y'all again. Very much appreciate your uh, sitting through and listening and learning. Thank you. Thank you.